tell, but the, the choir likes that anthem we sang this morning, uh, Prepare the Way of the Lord. Uh, when Ricarda uh, uh, was with us a year ago this time, we sang that anthem, and she had someone record that on her phone. Or we had maybe a tape, huh? A disc? Anyhow, <clears throat> when we were in Germany in September, she got up in front of this group of about 60 people and talked about her time here with this congregation, just glowing about uh, her experience. And then she said, and I want to share this. And on the screen came the picture of our choir singing, Prepare the Way of the Lord. It sounded pretty darn good. <laughs> <clears throat> And so, um, we are now famous in Germany. <laughs> it's a good thing. It's a good thing. That 13th chapter of Mark's Gospel that I read before sounds kind of strange to our 21st century ears. It seems to have a lot more in common with the book of Revelation than any other part of the New Testament. That chapter is what we call apocalyptic writing. Apocalyptic writing. Something that was popular in various times when the Hebrew people and then as the Christian community became a threatened community because of their enemies, people who wanted to do them harm. When the world around you seems to be going to hell in a handbasket, you go back to apocalyptic images and apocalyptic writing. Apocalyptic literature is prevalent when a nation or a people is under siege, is threatened, and under supreme duress. When you come to believe that something awful is about to happen, that your very existence may be threatened, you often turn to a vision of a grand re a reversal. When your side, the good side, now the siege is going to win, going to come to the top. When God or some other power is going to intervene, when the ordinary will be turned upside down and good will prevail and all those bad folks are going to get what's coming to them. Well, that's what we have for the suggestion lesson for the first Sunday of the season of Advent. This is New Year's Sunday, you know, in the Christian church. In the Christian church, we do not follow a calendar uh, year as such, but our year begins with the season of Advent, the first Sunday. This is New Year's Day for Christian people around the world. This marks the four weeks that precede Christmas when we celebrate the intervention of God into the world of human beings in a child born in Bethlehem. Advent, Christmas. To be followed soon by the seven weeks of Lent, tough weeks, in which we anticipate a crucifixion, but also a glorious resurrection on Easter and Eastertide. And that takes us usually through May and part of June. Then becomes a long season, June, July, August, September, October, even part of November, which we call Trinity season or ordinary time, which is the time of the Christian church. The time when we rehearse again who it is and how it was that people took the good news of Jesus Christ and spread it so that it would pass on from one generation to another. So the year begins with Advent. This is the first Sunday, a day of expectation, of anticipation, of almost walking on tiptoes to see what it is that God has in mind for us and for the world in which we live. Mark was the first of the four Gospels to be written. <clears throat> and Mark decided that he was not going to write a nice biography of Jesus. He says absolutely nothing about the birth of Jesus or any part of his early life. Mark becomes, begins his gospel with Jesus as an adult, bursting on the scene as this brand new 
preacher, teacher, healer, almost radical. This is not going to be the story of Jesus meek and mild. No, Jesus in Mark's gospel is going to be a controversial figure, taking on both the religious authorities of his time and the political powers that ruled their lives. If you look at the gospel, this 13th chapter appears right in the middle of Holy Week, after Palm Sunday, before Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So Jesus is in Jerusalem, the very center of religious and political power, and Jesus is doing some pretty radical things and saying some pretty <coughs> radical things. He is saying that the temple over there is coming down. The old ways of worshiping is going to be no more. And so it happened. He warns people about false messengers, false messiahs, phony leaders, false prophets who are going to try to lead people astray. Don't listen to them, says Jesus. And then there is this vision of the Son of Man coming in on the clouds and the world shaken by cosmic disruption. Bottom line is the, uh, the end is near. It's very near. In fact, in Mark's gospel, there was the belief it would happen before those living had died. Soon. Very soon. And so the message was watch and wait. Be vigilant. All of this is going to take place very soon. Some of you will live long enough to see it yourselves. Apocalyptic writing. If you like that kind of thing, read the book of uh, Revelation at the end of the New Testament. But don't, uh, don't think you're going to understand it very readily. It relies heavily on the book of Daniel and some other parts of the Old Testament and a whole lot of things that were going on, not at the time of Jesus, but around the year 100 AD. Well, <clears throat> this is the suggested text for this Sunday. And what are we going to do with this strange text? You might think it'd be better to just sing a couple more Christmas carols and then get on with the, uh, the business of really getting ready for uh, the real Christmas, which means decorating and food, and presents, and gatherings, and all that kind of thing. Well, for me, the bottom line of this apocalyptic mumbo jumbo is to remember that whatever happens, whatever you and I are able to see is not all that's going on. That there is a mind and a will of God that is at work in the midst of what is very confusing to us and always has been confusing. For the mind and the will of God always seems to be at work in the shadows. And we seldom understand it at the time. It's only after the fact, in the rear view mirror, we begin to understand. <clears throat> it's good for us to remember that there is a grand vision that God has for us and for this world. God is, of course, at the center of the vision, for this is God's world, always has been God's world and always will be. You can take that to the bank. But it's not easy to hang on to that sense, this is God's world, when there's so much contrary evidence around that things are not well and not good. There are many evidences that there are many powers and forces at work that are at cross purposes against God's will and against God's uh, intent. And many of those people and forces are people like us. That we really are the problem. We and others like us. You see, when in God's wisdom, God created human beings, granting to them freedom and autonomy the genie was out of the bottle. We are created in the image of God, but we were given this freedom and this autonomy, and that has set, set the stage all through the centuries for disobedience, for willfulness, for greed and exploitation and sin and inhumanity. And we have plenty of evidences of that. 
The vision, the grand vision, is captured in various places in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. This comes from the prophet Micah. This is the way it ought to be. God will judge between many peoples and shall, ar and shall arbitrate between strong nations far away. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. They shall all sit under their own vines and under their own fig trees, and no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. <coughs> that is a picture of God's intent, not only for us, but for all of God's children. And that's not exactly the world that you and I face Monday morning, Tuesday morning, and the rest of the week. In chapter 13 of Paul's letter to the Corinthians, Paul says that the superior gifts of the Spirit of God, the ways in which we know God is present, the gifts are faith, hope, and love. And for Paul, he says, and the greatest of these gifts is love. Well, I'm going to take issue with Paul. I'd like to make a case for hope being the equal of love. What Linda read before from 1 Peter chapter 3, I'd like to repeat. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you yet do it with gentleness and reverence. So the question comes, when was the last time you had to defend yourself from the accusation that you were too hopeful? That the way you looked out at the world and treated people was too hope-filled? That somehow this hope stuff has gotten in, in touch with you and that you're trying to live it out. Too much hope. Granted, there are some pretty daunting things that are around us every day. Wars and rumors of war and acts of inhumanity. Brother and sister, sister set against brother and sister. Folks eager to believe the very worst about anyone else. So the choice really is ours, always has been. Can we? Can we? you be a stubborn hoper in God's grand vision. This vision of uh, no more war, people living in peace under their vines and fig trees, and no one is afraid. In spite of the evidence that you have around you and your outlook, can you still hold on to the conviction that this is God's world, this has always been God's world, that God has not and will not abandon this world, and that the time you and I have to live in this world is precious time, and we are called to be unrepentant <coughs> hopers as we live each day. So be awake, be alert to God's abiding presence. Be filled with hope as you approach every new day that comes to you. Sing the carols of Advent and Christmas and notice how hope-filled they are. For they have provided sustenance to Christians all through the centuries. And those hymns come to us as well. God wins. Good wins. So look around you this week and always and view this world with the eyes of faith. Faith is important. See evidences of God's presence that provide for you hope. 
and be a stubborn lover of God, a stubborn lover of the neighbor, a stubborn lover of yourself. Please, love yourself. And be a stubborn lover of the redeemable world in which we are privileged to live. Amen.